Okay, we're live now. I guess we can turn on our video. Um, hi everyone. So I guess what do you want? So um, um would we'll, we'll does wait some seconds while everyone joining. So I've sent out um a quick PC to to get everyone joined. Um, welcome everyone. We'll be starting this long anticipated session very soon. Um, let's just wait some minutes while we get more people to join in and um, we'll kick start everything um, as soon as we have uh, more people joining. Um, welcome on board. Yeah, so it promises to be an exciting session. Um, Paul, Paul is going to be handling the, the comments. And um, so whichever, um, whenever we have questions, we're going to have, um, we're going to have, the, have the questions read out loud. Um, let's still wait some seconds while we still have more people joining. Um, and we can start. So once it's 5.05, .05, we'll begin. We'll begin um, our event. Thanks for joining in. Yeah, thanks for joining. We will be commenting. I will be commenting the event shortly. Um, let's just wait for more people to join in. Uh, 
Hi, um, Labi. Yeah, so thanks for joining me in Labi. You can you can see your comments here. Um, promises to be an exciting session. Just hope you, you tag along and wait, wait for our comments. Okay, so um, I guess now we can we can proceed and and as we proceed, more people will join us. So thanks for joining in, everyone. We'll be, um, this is this has been this has been a long anticipated event, um, something we've kept we've been planning for a while now, and so glad we are starting and we are having this finally. So I'm Paul Okeumi. I'm going to be um, I'm the current lead for current com um, com club captain and um, lead for um, Femi Aolo University. And something interesting about our, this event is, is a collaboration of three universities. So we have the Obafemi Aolo University, um, University of Ilori, and um, University of Lagos all coming together to make and bring to you this awesome event. And we have courses on the line, um, I courses. Yeah, we have other other yeah. So and we have other captains also on the call. So quickly, um, Paul. Okay, we can. So I, I, um, I've 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 told you about myself and. Uh, Paul. Courses, please. Can you hear him? Uh, Curtis, please, can you hear Paul? I I cannot hear him. Oh, all right. Uh, I think we lost Paul. Uh, welcome, guys. Welcome, guys. So let me just do my own introduction. Uh, my name is Joshua, but I go by CORE, and I am the captain for the University of Learning Cloud Club Group Community. And this event, as he said, is a collaboration of the three um, <laughs> universities, OAU, above um, the other university, and also UniLearning. And we brought Curtis to talk about reimagining how we store. Oh, we lost him completely. All right. Uh, so uh, you can, let me just give a brief overview of the way these things will go. The comment section, you want you to be very active and interactive. Once you have questions, you can drop it in, in the comment section and we will get to it at the end. So. We expect you guys to have questions because this is going to be a very exciting event. I'm very particularly excited and I'm pumped for this because this is all I live for, cloud computing, data, and things being and scale. So uh, I'll give the stage now to our speaker to walk his magic. Hi, Curtis, please. Hey, Koa, and thank you so much for that that warm introduction. Uh, can, can everyone thank hear you. me okay? I want to just make sure that uh, I'm being heard and can uh proceed with all of my sharing and everything um hopefully everyone can hear me just fine they can see the introductory slide that i want to bring to you today uh j just a quick uh, uh verbal approval i can okay uh, i awesome. can see you i can hear you concurrently but i can't see your slide okay um i should be doing a share now so if, if someone maybe wants to drop something in the comment section just to confirm that they can see that i want to make sure that the audience in attendance has full visibility all right, cool. Okay. Did we get the okay from anyone? So if you can see slides, because I can't, uh, please drop yeah. like a thumbs up or an emoji. All right. Uh, um, Dan Lalar, Moses, please, can you see his slide? Can you see the slide that Curtis is sharing? Oh, all right. I think this slide is called. Yeah, I can't see it now. Yes, okay. yes, go ahead. 
Awesome. Thanks. Well, why don't we go ahead and get started then? Um, I, I would uh, thanks everyone for having me today. I'm I'm truly honored to be able to prevent uh, present to uh, you know, students across the three various universities here. Uh, I know I've got just about 30 minutes to uh, present this to you today, and and quite frankly, I would rather have it more as a conversation than so much a presentation. Meaning that I do want everybody to take an opportunity to drop any questions into the uh, uh, comment section if they have them. Uh, Koha would uh, ask that you and Paul and, and anyone else uh, taking part of the moder moderation just kind of help feed some of the questions to me so that we can uh, we can answer them. Um, awesome. Just so I, I guess just kind of to answer why did I title the presentation this way? Um, it, it's storage is just a component of cloud computing. Um, when you think about cloud and cloud storage in particular, uh, you know, you've got companies and developers that can acquire from third party service providers like AWS, just a large variety of, of different options and resources. Um, we as the vendors are tasked with maintaining this global network of data centers that's going to house all the storage capacity. Uh, and you all effectively, you, you all being users and builders, are, are able to access these resources over the internet. And, you know, you pay for it or, or you use it in kind of a, a pay-per-use model. Uh, what that also entails is that you all don't have to worry about the management, the administrative overhead, or any of these resources. You simply upload your data, manage your data, manipulate your data, and and build your applications. Um, and to me, that's a great model, um, you know, which is also why uh, I think uh, ha having the, the the freedom of not being able to worry about those other things is, is where the reimagining in the title comes from. So I want us to just kind of think about that, you know, and now that we have been uh, given the ability, let, let's really think about what it is to build effective applications, what it means to build uh, good experiences for the end users of our services. Um, one thing I do think is important to call out, though, is that wh while all those other things are being taken care of, the, the reimagining of data and storage management doesn't remove you from some of the security implications. And we'll talk about that a little bit. And, and by that, I mean, you, you as users and builders uh, will be ultimately responsible for what it is that you store. So you definitely want to continue to take care of any sort of encryption or other data protection uh, and security measures uh, with regards to that. Um, just a little quick about me. Uh, so I am coming to you from the United States. I am based in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, some of you may be familiar with uh, that city or that location. I'll, I'll share a little more of a visual here with you in a second. Uh, I am five hours behind you guys, so I know this is a Friday afternoon and, you know, everyone's there looking to wrap up what I'm sure has been a long, uh, tumultuous week. So we'll, we'll certainly be mindful of that. Um, I do have over 20 years of industry experience. Um, like most of you, I was once a student uh, a while ago. Um, I studied physics and electrical engineering here at some of the local universities. Uh, I've been a member of the team at AWS since uh, 2016. So just over seven years, I've, I've really enjoyed the opportunity to do a lot of design and a lot of deployment of applications for a lot of, of customers in the cloud. Uh, just an example of some of the work that I've done in the past. Uh, if you think about restaurant chains that have the ability to build mobile applications so that, you know, those of us who are hungry uh, want to be able to order uh, those services in a hurry. Um, I've, I've worked with some U.S.-based uh, organizations to build those applications. Uh, I've also worked with uh, some big names within the entertainment and, and sports industries, um, as well as some companies that do digital and print media solutions. Uh, you guys are probably aware that uh, elections can be a very big uh, moment within in, you know any country's uh, time in history. Uh, I've helped build applications that allow people to go and access and retrieve real-time information about who's winning the elections, what are the results, uh, et cetera. Uh, and I've also, believe it or not, had an opportunity to work with cruise lines. Um, a lot of people don't realize that those very large cruise ships, which are like little floating cities, actually have data centers located on them. So it's a really interesting process to see when a ship comes to shore. Not only are they restocking that uh, ship with more food, more amenities, and, and getting other people on board, but there's also an operation that moves uh, a lot of the data that they've been collecting off of those ships while they've been out the shore uh, and then moving them along to, uh, to gather information. Um, here I mentioned I'm, I'm over here in the city of Atlanta. Uh, 
geographically speaking, that's roughly about 9,400 kilometers or about a little under 6,000 miles. Um, if, if you're, if you're curious. So, uh, and I also call out in this graphic, uh, you see those three dots, uh, for those of you that have some familiarity with AWS and, and the AWS platform, uh, things are categorized into what we call regions, uh, here in the United States, the three primary regions, uh, if I read this from left to right on my screen, on the far left there, you have us West, which is in our state of Oregon which ironically is not very far from the uh, Amazon headquarters, which is based in Seattle, Washington, just north of that. Uh, and then you, as you move yourself across the United States, you see that Ohio location uh, and then the Northern Virginia. So I always like to provide those just to give some visual context, but because off, oftentimes all we ever see are management consoles when working with AWS. Okay, so let's just kind of move into storage. Uh, since 2006, and, and our Amazon Simple Storage Service, or S3, was one of the first services that was actually created in that first year uh, of Amazon or AWS's inception. Uh, and along with everything else that they've been building to that point, you know, we, we've always strived to try to be as agile as possible, uh, do everything we can with our service offerings to help people uh, accelerate their innovation. Uh, again, going back to that reimagining theme I talked about early, uh, and to do other things like keep their uh, security strong uh, and keep the, a reduction in cost. Now, how that lends itself to uh, cloud storage in general, um, I won't read all of these areas in entirety, but if you move kind of around this graphic uh, clockwise, you know, th things like resiliency and the ability to scale uh, and have your data stored in a very durable fashion are always going to be some of the benefits you realize as you start uh, becoming more familiar and working with cloud services uh, within your journeys. Uh, and then, of course, there's also going to be uh, lots of controls and capabilities that allow you to manage the data um, to gain insights. You know, we, we're now in this new uh, shifting world of machine learning and generative AI. Uh, those are always going to be helpful benefits. Um, I'll even talk a little bit later about uh, how you actually move data between environments. I mean, if you, if you think about uh, uh, data at scale, uh, terabytes, petabytes, uh, even exabytes of data in some cases, it, it takes a lot to be able to, to, to not only manage that data, but have it where you need it. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that as well too. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the performance and, and, and some of the other areas as well too. Uh, one thing I also wanna call out in terms of just this reimagining theme that I've talked about is if you think about a cloud provider and being able to, to provide cloud services, another huge benefit is that anytime a new enhancement or improvement is made, and, and it could be targeted at just one customer or one user, everybody benefits from it. So I, I think that's always a huge thing to uh, to kind of take away. Um, I want to touch on a couple of these just a little bit. If you think about it in terms of durability, uh, imagine what happens anytime you've got some important data stored in just a single location. If that drive fails or if that system fails or if the net uh, uh, connect, uh, network connectivity is not available there, uh, you're going to have trouble accessing your data. Uh, and, and that really speaks to, well, exactly uh, how durable or, or how usable is my data if I'm subjected to hardware failures, connection failures, building failures, et cetera. Uh, that's one of the things that uh, having a cloud storage environment can help you with as far as that reimagining. Um, if you think about every time you go and store a single byte or, or multiple bytes of data in the cloud, that piece of data is going to be replicated over multiple storage resources and in multiple locations. Um, all that brings up what I'm showing here to the right, which is that uh, I'll, I'll just count them up. It's 11 nines of durability, meaning that once you've got information stored up there, you know, you can uh, be, be very much assured that it, it's it's going to remain exactly where it, it belongs. Um, and then in terms of the man manageability, uh, I'll come back to some of these as well, too, and I'll show it in some of the other uh, things I'm going to illustrate here for you shortly, but uh, having the ability to uh, organize your data, be able to monitor things, uh, replicate data, and modify it are also going to be very uh, uh, beneficial uh, 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 things that you have when you're talking about managing your data in cloud. Um, if you think about cloud services, now we won't go into each of these in detail today. Um, we're going to focus mostly on that bottom piece of the, the three-piece pie there, which is the object storage, but you know that there are other forms of 
storage that are available in these services. Uh, when you think about block storage, that, that's more akin to uh, your typical hard drives that you will see within a physical computer. Um, they're normally stored in the form of a data volume, uh, most times attached to a single machine, but uh, we have services and capabilities in cloud that allow them to extend over multiple machines. Um, they're very low latency. So if you need kind of the highest or the fastest of performance, obvi uh, uh, oftentimes block storage is what you want to go with. Uh, another form is file storage. Uh, think about these as kind of your typical shared data environments where multiple users can have access to the same data. Uh, and then there's the object storage component, which again, I, I said we're going to focus on uh, mostly here. Uh, with object storage, you've got data that's stored across a flat file structure. Um, oftentimes, you will have information that's uh, referenced or, or referred to as metadata, where you've got like uh, key value pairs that you can use to describe your data uh, a lot more. Um, and it, it's really kind of becoming the norm when you think about uh, cloud storage today. Again, I, I talked a little earlier about the S3 data early. Think, think of S3 as, as kind of a, a, a tier one class of, uh, of object data, if you will. Um, I won't go into a whole lot of these other services here, but what I will say is, is that um, the ability to storage, manage, and leverage data in cloud comes in a lot of forms. So I, I want to focus less on the services uh, and pay a little more attention into just the use cases. So if you think about opportunities to um, uh, be able to build and manage applications from a hybrid perspective, and by hybrid, I mean having some of your resources and data in cloud versus having some, uh, you know, somewhere in a, in a managed data center or, or maybe even in a local environment. Uh, things of that nature. Um, Real-time data is also becoming a very big component. Um, th think about the ability to uh, access, collect, and process data in real time. Um, uh, for some of you that may have some awareness of, you know, streaming services or other uh, online or web-based applications like uh, uh, online games, for that matter, um, those create opportunities for you to be able to collect, grab, process, and, and uh, uh, analyze data in near real time, which, which really adds to the enhancement or the experience to, uh, uh, to, to your users. Um, remote data is also an interesting one as well to uh, uh, the, the motion picture industry is big here in the U.S. And if you think about uh, having the ability to shoot uh, on location or off site somewhere, uh, ha having a means to be able to, to capture all of that uh, high resolution video, store it locally on site and then be able to move it uh, somewhere at a later point, particularly in the cloud is also a benefit here. That, that's very similar to what I was talking about earlier when I made reference to the uh, to the cruise ships that I, that I used to work with. Um, just want to talk real quick here about, you know, what does that all uh, mean in terms of just uh, what, what uh, developers are building these days? Um, there's tons of backup and restore applications, uh, you know, archive and compliance. Uh, for those of you that are uh, pretty familiar with traditional uh, Linux uh, or multi-user environments, there, there's the home directory concepts. Um, with cloud, you're being able to make what was once old new again. Uh, and then, of course, business critical applications and, and data lakes. Uh, I, I can't underscore enough the importance of, of what uh, data lakes are becoming now, uh, as I mentioned, in this whole new age of uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, just to give you an example of what I was talking about in terms of backup strategies, uh, think about daily backups, you know, b backups that um, you want to maybe have uh, a, a nightly capture for, for two weeks in a row. Um, you can then extend that into weekly backups where you could just have that single backup over the course of three months. Uh, and then that same backup strategy could then be extended through quarterly backups and yearly backups as well to uh, understand that each of these different backup types oftentimes will require a, a different type of storage class or, or storage use case. Uh, and then again, the, the beauty of cloud is they, they have kind of a, a, a solution that'll fit them all. So as you guys go and start thinking about the different ways that you need to have a data and in what forms uh, later in your careers, uh, know that there's always going to be uh, a, a solution that, that you have there. Uh, again, talking a little more here about data, data lakes being the new normal uh, in this age here. Um, with the data lake, you can do what they call breaking down of data silos and, and basically maximize the ability to, to generate the insights, um, especially when it comes to things like uh, machine 
uh, learning and, and model training uh, and things of that nature. And, and it's always going to be hugely beneficial to have an object storage service that can store massive amounts of data that can allow that data to be accessed by different uh, resources and platforms uh, and, and, and really be able to uh, what we like to call future proof, meaning that as new storage and or excuse me, as new compute resources and, and new applications come along, uh, that storage will already be there and available to be able to serve those needs. So a, a huge benefit right there. Um, I gave us a little preview earlier about manageability. Um, as I look to break these down a little more, when we talk about organizing, uh, having the ability to tag your objects, you know, it, it's one thing to just have a file name associated with a piece of data, but it's another to be able to use things like tags and metadata to be able to store additional information about it. And again, I'll share a little bit of an, a, a demonstration here momentarily. Uh, same thing goes for monitoring. Uh, imagine having the ability that every time a piece of data moves or changes, you can trigger some sort of a notification event to be able to act upon it in a certain way. Um, usually an easy example would be if, if I were to upload a piece of video, um, oftentimes a, a piece of stream video could run for several minutes or several hours long, depending on what it is. But for me to be able to trigger and create what are called thumbnails or just, you know, little captures or pieces of that data is always going to be helpful too. Um, same thing goes with the ability to replicate information and to be able to do some modifications as well. Uh, any any questions from, from anyone at this moment? Uh, guys, do we see anything uh, in the form of questions out there from, from the audience? Um, no questions yet. Not really. Uh, so, once again, guys, Oh, sorry. I'm having a some some wind. Diff was was that a questionnaire or, or someone just were just saying we're good? Yeah, we're we're good. No questions yet. Okay, cool. Um, what I'm also going to move over to now is just to kind of quickly show you guys. Uh, earlier, I talked about the three different classes of data. Um, if everyone can now see uh, this terminal screen that I'm in, uh, basically what I'm doing now is I've gone out and connected to an EC2 instance that I have running on AWS, uh, and it's basically a server. It's a, it's, a, it's a virtual machine that allows me to go and, and do things in the environment. Uh, and what I wanted to do quickly with this virtual machine is if we go back to those three different storage classes, uh, what I wanted to do was just to quickly show that from a single virtual machine, I have the ability to go out and access each of those three different service types. Um, what I'm showing here first is this is that block storage device here. Uh, and for those of you that have a little familiarity with Linux commands, and anytime you go out and do a list of your block devices, which is what I'm doing here on this resource, there you see I've got this uh, configured and partitioned uh, 20 gigabyte volume that allows me to go out there and access data. Um, I mentioned that if I needed uh, a, a, a storage a resource that can allow me through low latency to be able to go out and process data uh, fast, then I can take advantage of the storage block. Uh, the second one here uh, is an actual uh, NFS mount that I created with another file service of ours called uh, Elastic File Store or, or, or EFS. Um, I created it, I mounted it to this machine, and now this gives me the ability to actually go out there and share resources with other users. Uh, any of the files you see out here in this mount for other users that are connected to the environment as well, they too can access them. Uh, one of the things, um, I'm sorry, go ahead. Was there a question? Yeah. Um, so yeah, someone, um, you can, can zoom in into the, to the sure. Okay. Thank you. Is is that a little better? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you can zoom in a little more. Let me try it one more time. Uh, I think I might have reached the capacity of my uh, font size. Let me see. Um, terminal state. Uh, I'll try to bump it up one more time. If if I can't, oh, there we go. Okay. I think I got it just a little bit bigger there. Is that is that better, everybody? Looks like I still maybe having some trouble here. Um, yeah, maybe we can bump it up a little more. Okay, uh, a few more times here. 
Okay, okay. Getting, getting really big now. There, there we go. Is that better? Yeah, it seems to be better. Okay. Um, I apologize if someone seeing it is kind of blurry. I'm, I'm wondering if that may not be a, a condition of your, your connection there. But uh, it's 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 basically a terminal window that I have up here. Um, what I can yep. do, uh, captains, is just send out some screen captures uh, for everyone to see later, so that they'll have uh, uh, better better visibility now. Okay, it looks like some people are getting a little better view of it now, which is good. So for those of you that may not be able to see it, I apologize. Um, yeah. So again, j j for those that now have better visibility, I wanted to just go back and and repoint to uh, what we were talking about earlier about. Uh, ha having a, uh, a block device out here, as well as having a, uh, a NFS share device as well. Um, T file sys. Uh, here again, you see from one system, I'm able to access both of those. And then the other uh, piece that I also have to share is the uh, object component. We, we talked a little bit about the, the S3 piece a little earlier. Um, here, I'll go and run. Uh, what is now a command that I just invoke to say, okay, from this compute resource, go out and show me some of my object services that are available. And here, what we're seeing is just a number of what are referred to as uh, object buckets or S3 buckets within AWS that allows me to go out and uh, ha have a look at that data. So um, let's just do this. I will go inside an actual bucket device this time. And show that I have a few objects that are that are listed out there. Um, and and with the ability to go out and access these data sources as well to you, you know, yeah, you now have the ability to go out and, and perform a, a bunch of different uh, operations to uh, list the information that you have available, uh, get an idea of just how many uh, storage devices or, or, or objects that you have. Um, I'll jump back over, I'll jump out of this for a second and then go back over to the uh, to the display here because one, one of the things I also want to demonstrate is that uh, once you start and, and what I'm just showing you guys are just a handful of, of objects and operations that um, uh, bode well for a demonstration when, when you start talking about the ability to manage resources at scale here and, and I actually had to pull this graphic from the, uh, the, the management console uh, within AWS. Um, here you can see that I have buckets out there that have uh, just a little north of 15 million objects stored in them um, that are consuming uh, roughly about 200 uh, gigabits of storage size. Uh, and, and this can scale tremendously. Uh, by S3 uh, standards, th this is relatively small. If you, if you think about someone who's capturing satellite or image video or, or a very large scale application, that number of 15 million could easily go into the billions uh, for some users. And those gigabytes can easily move up into the petabyte and to the exabyte scale as well too. Um, here are just some additional numbers if you start to think about just what I'm talking about. And, and a lot of these are, are, are by day and, and by second metrics. Um, if you think about a large global object service that can help you uh, understand just the scale at which you can operate, uh, imagine a service having the ability to manage over 200 trillion objects globally uh, and process over 100 million requests per second. Um, earlier, I mentioned having uh, as part of that manageability uh, event notifications to be able to trigger uh, well, that's happening, uh, you know, at a daily rate over of 125 billion events. And again, the, the, this is not just a single customer. This is a large, growing number of customers across the entirety of the, the object storage landscape that is S3. And, and it, you know, pr pretty much could be said for a lot of the other uh, enterprise level cloud providers out there as well, too. Um, again, f 4 billion checksums and then just hundreds of thousands of data lakes. Uh, that are running as well too. Um, probably about 12 minutes or so right now. Um, in, any additional questions before I go in to talk a, a, a little bit about security and access control and, and maybe even talk a little bit about how you as builders can go and start uh, accessing some of these uh, services as well. All right, sounds like we might be good. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, go ahead, Paul, any questions? 
Um, no, not 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 really. Um, so um, you talked about the the various kind of storage. I think which which of them do you think would be closest to to say um, guys doing just side projects? So yeah. Um. <sighs> Honestly, I, I would think either uh, your object or your block would be good for file uh, uh, side projects. Um, go, right. Going back to what I had earlier here, and, and again, I apologize if everybody's having too much trouble seeing this. Yeah, if we're talking about side projects, Paul, then yeah, definitely having the ability to go out and just easily uh, uh, provision uh, some compute resources and then maybe attach uh, a 20 gigabyte uh, drive to it, just like I have here, would certainly make it easy for everyone to get up and started relatively fast. Um, mm -hmm. That's not to say that you couldn't do the same with the file service as well, too. It's just that if you're doing it for your own individual purposes, then there's probably no need to go out there and create a, a, a file store that's shareable across a number of users to uh, if, if it's not necessary. So I, I would say the, either the block or the object based on your uh, Based on your needs, does that help? Yeah, yeah, that that, make, that makes sense. Okay, perfect. Well, um, one more question. One question from Paul. Um, sure. Go ahead, Paul. So saying, how do you decide what data storage service to use? Um, what are the indications for each use case? For each case, um, you yeah, use case. Oh, uh, so yeah. In in the case of storage, um, I'll take you back to what I said earlier. Uh, when we think about the the block storage here, if if low latency is what you need, th think about a, a a pharmaceutical company that needs to run very fast processing jobs. Um, more than likely, they want to be able to reduce the latency required to go and access, read, process the data. So you want something as close to the compute as you can, and, and that's going to give you this block uh, as kind of a leading candidate there. Uh, conversely, say you're running a website and you have the need to be able to share data with users across the globe. Uh, I'm not sure how popular uh, a streaming service like Netflix is uh, in, in your respective areas there. But if you think yeah, about it, uh, perfect. Uh, so so imagine Netflix on, on a Friday night. Everybody's going to go home. They're going to go and watch their favorite shows. Uh, we need the ability to be able to serve that streaming media out to as many people as we can. That, that, that's, a, that's an application that requires scale. So you're, you're looking at something that's probably more within the uh, object database uh, uh, classes as, as well there. So, uh, and then again, the, the file is, uh, th think about a, a university um, that requires the need to go and have students collaborate on a development project or, or something else where if I make an update to a file, then you, know, you Paul need to be able to access those updates as well too. So those are usually the kind of factors you wanna consider uh, amongst others, in terms of uh, which is going to be the right for you, because oftentimes you have to consider other things as well, too, like cost, uh, like global reach, um, uh, and et cetera. So it, it, it could be a ton of factors. We, we hate to use the answer, but we always use it a lot. And that is, is it depends. <laughs> yep. uh, all, right, all right. All right. Cool. All right. Uh, let me double check my time here. How, how are we doing on time? Uh, probably just a few more minutes here. Um, I was hoping to maybe uh, be able to get into just a couple of uh, uh, coding examples with you guys. Um, I'll, Captains, I'll leave you with some of this follow-up uh, information to be able to help uh, some okay. of the students on to, to get a better idea of this. Um, and you probably will, will need to provide some help for them as well, too, in terms of having the ability to go out and, and access compute. Um, perhaps maybe we can set up a workshop for these guys to, to get involved with or, or some means in which, you know, they can all get their hands uh, on an AWS account and be able to go out here and, and run some of these operations. But basically what I'm showing here is just a quick and easy example. If you were to use something like uh, a Flask to be able to go out and then just uh, create a short demo uh, with a web interface that will allow someone th the ability to go out and click a button that says upload, be able to choose a local file uh, uh, based on their machine, and then be able to move that into an S3 bucket. Um, this is basically a, a template in which uh, they would have the ability to go out there and do something like that. Um, similarly, if you wanted to just go and 
by way of command line, just cr create a file and upload it directly to uh, an S3 bucket. You could use something like the uh, the, the Boto3 libraries, which which are Python based, uh, and be able to go out there and and you know quickly write a session that will allow you to specify a few object calls. Uh, put in some text information uh, and be able to upload that information right away. Um, let me see a few other things here. Again, I, I wish we had a little more time to go into these. Um, we, we talked about use cases a second ago. Uh, again, these are some other factors that you would have to uh, look into in terms of deciding which of your uh, uh, services are going to be best for your use case. Uh, and what I'm illustrating here with the timeline across, ever, ever since 2006, we've been working on additional uh, services to be able to uh, match those use cases as, as best as possible. Um, if we go back to the Netflix example real quick, uh, th think about a movie that is not as popular these days, but they want to be able to keep around for kind of legacy purposes. Uh, think about that going into what they call kind of a deeper archive of storage, which is uh, not used as frequently, but certainly um, uh provide some benefits in terms of some uh, cost savings as well, too. And I'll show a different uh, uh, a graphic here to kind of illustrate those same storage classes based on, you know, from left to right, how frequent the data is accessed versus how infrequent uh, is accessed. And, and here, uh, you, you guys are probably more familiar with the terms hot data, warm data, and, and cold data. And, and that all pretty much uh, uh, still, you know, kind of kind of relates as well here, too. Um, just want to jump over to replication real quick before we, we jump off. Uh, replication is basically the ability to go and duplicate your data in multiple locations. Uh, think about how having a service that can do that for you relatively seamlessly will give you, again, that opportunity to do what we call reimagine how you use data today. Uh, imagine I store a piece of data in location A, and then there are some services behind the scenes that are actually going to go and place it in another location for me. Um, huge, huge benefit. Um, where that would uh, allow itself to uh, uh, benefit an application, uh, I tried to locate this pin here right uh, in and around uh, that, that Nigeria area where you guys are located. So imagine I have services that are dumping data in uh, resources in Northern Virginia in the U.S., as well as those in Asia Pacific and Sydney. Regardless of which location, uh, those are going to be stored. They're both going to be kind of cross-replicated so that every data object is going to be located in both of those locations. Uh, let, let me say that again. If, if we were to label all of our odd data going to U.S. East and all of our even data going into Asian Pacific, uh, after just a few minutes, you can expect all of the odd and even data to be located in both of those locations so that when end users uh, within the Lagos uh, uh, area are able to go and access that information, uh, they can get it from the closest location, which keeps their latency low. So uh, another good example uh, there. Um, again, I know I'm running short of time here. Uh, for those of you, I would love for you to go and uh, by way of using that QR code there in the upper right hand corner, um, go and take a look at an a article I wrote that talks about uh, data object life cycles. Um, this article, I think, will give you a little more perspective in terms of just, you know, what we talked about here, uh, different data types and different data use cases. It doesn't so much go into the services we talked about. We'll, we'll still have to rely on some of the additional lessons and teachings um, that we talked about earlier to give you guys more understanding about the services. But I, I think this article would do a really good job in terms of being able to um, go and talk to you guys about, you know, what it means to manage different sorts of data types uh, through various life cycles today. Um, how are we doing, guys? I, I was going to maybe try to walk us through a quick quiz real quick, but I'm, I'm not sure if we have enough time for that. Uh, if not, yeah, we, I want... I, we, we can go ahead with that, actually. Oh, okay. We, we're still good on time? Okay, yeah. cool. Um, hopefully some of these, and, and we don't have to answer these aloud, but I, I want you guys to just kind of think about some of these uh, and, and just kind of kind of answer along. Uh, ho hopefully we were able to cover most of these in such a short amount of time. But earlier we did talk about uh, asking what are some of the benefits of cloud storage. Uh, would like for you all to just kind of think out loud. Wh which amongst these choices do you think 
are considered uh, or is not uh, 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 classified as a, a benefit of cloud storage? Um, the answer for that would be they're all benefits of cloud storage. Okay, so um, Curtis, I, I don't know if I can quickly break it there. So we have um, some, j just for guys that have been paying attention, um, yeah, some things I can you stand to gain if you happen to be just the first person to to put 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 in the the rest uh, like put in the correct answer. So maybe we could wait some seconds. Yeah, so like AWS socks and okay. You know, guys that. All right, cool. Um, so just just help me guide through that because I can't see the comments right now, Paul. So yeah, no, no, uh, I'm Paul I'll, under that. All right, I'll I'll move on to the next question and then I'll pause ten seconds to give some some responses to put up there. All right, let's go. Okay. okay. Uh, can somebody tell me what is the definition of object storage? And again, I'll just pause a few seconds here for everybody to mull over the four different options and uh, tell me what you think here in a second. Paul, you let me know when you've got a few uh, selections entered into the comments. You don't have to tell me what they are, but just just let me know when there's some there. Uh, all right. So I think I've, we've gotten two responses. Okay, three responses. Okay. So, all right. Yeah, yeah, I guess. All right, I'll go ahead and post the answer. Uh, hopefully somebody chose C. Okay. Ob object storage is a method of storing files in a flat address space based on key value attributes. Uh, I'll admit this one was a little tricky because uh, some of you may have been thinking hierarchical structure uh, or uh, it will it certainly shouldn't have been individual blocks, but because we talked about block storage being that kind of a traditional hard disk drive look in terms of the different storage classes. So ho hopefully we uh, got us got us a winner there. Um, this next one. Uh, go ahead, Paul. Did you have anything else you wanted to jump in? Yeah, on? So um, I just wanted to ask um, if um Nayabi. Ni so Nayabi um responded first. I wasn't I'm not sure if it's if he's in my university, but if it's not, he will be getting his, his own from, from Paul. And I'll be get I'll be I'll be giving um the next person who got it um from here. Awesome. Um, yeah. Congrats. Okay, next question. This one be hopefully a little easier. It's a true false. As a security best practice, public access to data should be disabled by default. Um, just a little hint, we, we didn't touch on this specifically, but we did say earlier that security should always be considered job one. Got any answers posted yet? Yeah, so we, we have three responses. Okay. Cool. Well, who, whoever chose true and chose it first are going to be your winners. Uh, and again, right. I apologize. In the interest of time, I wasn't able to go into this more specifically. But yeah, uh, anytime you are looking to uh, leverage cloud data, always be mindful and, and always have kind of a security first posture, meaning un unless that data absolutely needs to be enabled for public access, always disable it by, by default. Mm -hmm. All right, we ready to move on? Yeah. I think we've got two or three more of these, so get, get, get your minds ready, everybody. Here's the next question. With object storage, how can you organize your data to mimic a folder hierarchy? Um, no response yet. And again, I apologize. Um, ha had we had enough time, we, we would have gone into some of these in a little more detail. So I will I will take uh, <laughs> complete blame for for not having enough time to go into these in depth uh, as we should have. It's, it's totally fine, Curtis. Um, yeah. In fact, that that'll be an opportunity for us to actually go through an actual camp where we can we can spend several hours with accounts to be able to do this. All right. Still no responses yet. Okay, we've gotten we've gotten some responses. Okay, so, well let's uh, let's let's see who chose B. I, I guess only only Paul chose B. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. So, uh, Paul, Paul happens to be a captain, so you won't be, you won't be getting. <laughs> yeah. Well, ho hopefully, 
ho hopefully the trigger for this answer was in the question I said to mimic a folder hierarchy, meaning that, yeah, you don't create folders and subfolders. Uh, and again, we didn't get to talk about it in depth, but uh, object storage, uh, one of the characteristics of object storage also is that, you know, you do have kind of that flat file structure so that instead of traditional hierarchical folders and fo uh, subfolders, you create um, uh, prefixes with delimiters in them. And, and they can almost be endless, which... Uh, on the one hand, might be a little cumbersome, but in the other, uh, it helps you to manage a lot more data at scale. All right, next question here. What are the three main categories of cloud storage? Just looking for somebody to be quick on their feet with this one. Yeah, this doesn't seem quite easy. <laughs> <laughs> Gotten some okay. responses yet? Yeah, I've gotten three responses. Okay. All right, and then let's let's hope. Uh, yeah, right. let's let's hope all responses were a. Yeah. Block storage, e. file storage, object storage. Okay, good. All right. All right. Last question here. Uh, let's do it. Okay. Uh, I think we did storing data in multiple locations is known as. Yeah, we touched on this. All right, I'll reveal the answer in three, two, one. Data replication. Yeah. All right. Yeah. No, yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and just m migration is when you move data from one location to another. We, we talked about hybrid and talked about moving data to cloud earlier. Uh, if I'm an organization that's looking to completely uh, uh, remove myself out of my own data centers and go to cloud, I'll do a migration. Encryption is a security requirement. That's when you want to be able to, you know, leverage security keys and and everything to keep your sensitive data as as well protected as possible. Uh, data deduplication is a uh, is a compression uh, or, or, or or size reduction process in which you know you want to be able to uh, compress your data by some orders uh, orders of magnitude to be able to uh, maximize on your available space. So just a little bit about those. All right, thanks guys. Um, again, apologies. Uh, I, I think if we had more time, everybody would have probably scored a 100 on those. Uh, for those of you that want to continue to uh, kind of go down your learning journey path, uh, in addition to some of the other uh, events and activities that your uh, captains are going to be putting together for you. Uh, I want to remind everybody that we do have some uh, storage learning uh, uh, tracks that we can uh, that you all can take uh, through our skill builder service. Um, you can actually go out and and uh, conduct learning specific to object block and file storage in addition to data protection and disaster recovery uh, as well as migration. Uh, these are a couple of uh, QR codes that you may want to grab real quick. Uh, m most notably, the one on the left. Uh, that, that skill builder QR code on the left will take you to the websites that will get you on the road to being able to uh, uh, study for and, and sign up. And, and this is all, should all should be free learnings for you to go out and uh, take advantage of some of those storage resources available. Uh, but those of you that are interested in wanting to get some certifications, grab that QR code on the right. Again, I'll make sure the captains have these uh, post calls so that you will all still be able to uh, access them. Uh, and then lastly, if you could just do me a favor, take this QR code here and answer just a quick uh, two or three question survey uh, about the experience today. Um, for the event, just enter in there. This was the July 2023 storage session. Um, that way we'll know uh, where to kind of categorize the, the, the feedback that you guys provide. You know, we encourage everybody to go out there and do that. And um, uh, I'll stick around for a few more questions, uh, uh, Paul, Lakande, and team, if, if there are others. Um, uh, otherwise, you know, that's, uh, that's all my time. And, and again, I would highly recommend that if you guys wanted to get together again and go into something a little more in depth by way of a workshop, uh, let's plan it and let's let's make it happen for everybody's uh, for everybody's enjoyment. All right, thank thanks a lot, Curtis. Um So while you stick around, I I guess we have one question. Sure. From um, yeah, so Niobe, um, Niobe, Niobe, sir, 
sorry if I if I didn't pronounce that correctly. Um, it's say it's saying it seems you could move around the AWS resources just making use of the CLI. Are there resources that can help to write CM um, commands to move around the AWS CLI? Yeah. So um, th there are we have SDKs for the most popular programming languages that are available. Uh, you know, think Python, Java, JavaScript, Go, Rust. Uh, I, I think there's some 11 or so that support it today. Uh, if I go, um, yeah, this is probably not, this is an example of, uh, yeah, th this is probably the closest representation that I provided today. But yeah, j just know that we have a, a number of uh, SDKs that are available for some of your favorite programming languages that will actually allow you to go and write uh, full-fledged applications that can take advantage of some of these S3 services that we um, that we showed today. Is uh, is 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 that a help uh, uh, in terms of the question asked here? Okay, so you can just respond in the chat section if that answers the question. Allow me to yeah, so um, in the absence of that, do we have any more questions? I would want to give um, give the floor to one more person. Um, just go ahead to put out your questions and I'll read them out loud. Just to make it more interactive, if you get to ask questions, you get free stickers. I think we have a bunch of AWS stickers here. Okay, you said not totally clear, but yeah, I get it. Okay, um, look, so, Paul, can, Paul if, if, yeah, um, con connect us offline. I, I want to make sure I, I can uh, give clarity on, on what it is that, it, that uh, Nuaibi is after. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure to pass, pass along this question or connect to you. Um, so any more questions, guys, before we round up this awesome session? Okay, I guess I guess that will be it. Um, so, um, I'm, like speaking for for Paul and speaking for Toyib and every other captain that uh, we work together to bring this um, into reality, I want to say a, a huge thank you to you, Curtis. Um, I'm right from the planning now to the execution. We really want to say thanks for your time, and um, I would want to work with you um, on subsequent events. And yeah, I want to say. We're really, really grateful um, for giving us this time. So, um, whatever whatever thing was discussed, and you have questions, please do do well to relate them to me. I'll pass them along to Curtis. Um, so, for everyone, for everyone who answered questions in the comment section and from um, above me Law University, you can always meet me at White House or reach out to me on what um, on WhatsApp. I'll I'll give you guys um, a bit of this. So for making the whole session interactive and and that will be it from me. So I don't know if any other club captain wants to say anything. So Paul in the comment section is saying, um, thanks for your great presentation. So yeah, um, thanks, any more questions? In, so I guess in the absence of no questions, I want to say we've come to the end of, of this awesome session and, um, and yeah, that will be it. Thanks, everyone. So, um, guys, bye, everyone. See you in the next event coming up shortly.